Okay, so that then moves us on to our sort of final speaker um, who's with us today. So um, we've got Steve Reicher, who is he uh, is the Bishop Wardlaw Professor of Social Psychology at the University of St Andrews. Uh, so Steve is a social psychologist with a particular interest in group processes covering such issues as crowd behaviour, leadership, conformity and intergroup inter hatred. Uh, he's a fellow of the British Academy, of the Academy of Social Sciences and at the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, as well as the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Um, he served on the advisory groups to the UK and Scottish governments on COVID-19 uh, and he's also a core member of the Independent SAGE group uh, and was convener of its behavioural group before it merged into uh, ND SAGE. Um, he's acted as a witness in the 2021 People's COVID Inquiry. Um, he's been a long-time social activist and trade unionist and he's keenly interested in collective action and movement building as a participant as well as an academic. So I invite Steve to come up uh, for his presentation. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me today um, on this beautiful, sunny Glasgow day. Um, and many of the themes that we've been talking about so far today, issues of narrative, um, issues of convergence, I'm going to touch upon. Um, but let me start off by <coughs> saying something about how I came to be interested as an academic in collective behaviour and social movements, because I want to make a point out of it. thinking how long ago it was. It was 1975, which tells you how old I am, and it was my first year at university. And I was a, once, I was a nice boy from a nice family, and a decision was being made um, at Bristol University, where I was then, about an occupation. Should we occupy the Senate House around an issue of creating a nursery in the university? Actually, the issue was about women's access uh, to universities, and the nursery was, was key to that. As I say, being a nice boy from a nice family, people who occupied uh, university buildings were the sort of people my mother used to warn me about, and I was very <laughs> nervous about going into this occupation. And in the end, I decided that since I'd been involved in the debate, I would. And it was for me a transformative experience. Because at that point, in my first year, I was learning the classic models of group and crowd behaviour, which are all about how negative groups and crowds are. In fact, most group psychology comes out of a fear of the masses in the 19th century. Industrialisation creates the masses, and the elites are afraid of those masses, that those masses might challenge their power. So they respond by telling you how irrational the mass is, how the mass, the crowd, is all about loss, loss, <coughs> of identity, loss of rationality, loss of morality. So the narrative is entirely negative. It's one that is dismissive. It's one that is uh, derogatory. It's one that is entirely distorted. Because what I found in that occupation, in that collective setting, was the one thing I'd expected to get at the university, which I never did. I went to university thinking that if I'd go to university, and people would sit around and have deep philosophical conversations about the important things in life. And I discovered that people went to what was then the disco and got pissed. And the one place that they didn't was in the occupation. In the occupation, there was a deep commitment. We stayed up till 3 o'clock in the morning discussing issues of equality and inclusion and access to universities. We talked about strategy, we talked about tactics. It was intellectually exhilarating, it was precisely the opposite. So that disjunction between what I was learning academically about groups and the collective, and what I experienced was what it led me into studying, now for nearly 50 years, groups and crowds. And I make that point because for me, the notion that academia will provide the answers is deeply problematic. It's not a one-sided thing. Whether I have learned more as an academic from my activism and the activism of others, or whether I have given anything back as an academic to activism, I don't know. But certainly, this is not about the academic coming along and giving you the answer to how to build movements. You 
have as much, if not more, to give me than I have to give you. Right? It's a matter of a dialogue. It's a matter of an interchange. It's a matter of learning from each other and perhaps systematizing that knowledge in a way that it can then be useful to still others. But if we can learn from each other, I think also we can learn from our enemies. And I think it's important to learn from our enemies. Because one of the reasons why we're in the mess we're in is because our enemies have often been more effective at building movements and mobilizing than ourselves. Both specifically mobilizing against health mobilizing against the NHS and more generally. I think if you had to point to one social movement over the last few decades in Britain that have been incredibly successful, sadly, it wouldn't be a movement on health. It wouldn't be a movement on the environment. It would be an entirely reactionary, backward-looking movement. It would be Brexit. Because remember, when Brexit started, nobody expected it to happen. When Boris Johnson decided to campaign for it, he told David Cameron he didn't expect to win. On the, even on the night of the election, remember, Farage thought they'd lost. They couldn't conceptualise the fact that they would win, which is why they weren't prepared for it in any way at all. Now, it was entirely toxic, but at another level it was entirely brilliant that it understood the process of mobilisation in terms that the Remain campaign never did. They understood that, especially in England, there was a profound sense of loss, a profound sense of decline. And they exemplified that in that brilliant slogan, Take Back Control. And they created, albeit dishonestly, and albeit using lies, a narrative of where that decline came from. They identified a source. They provided a solution. And they exemplified that in vivid and concrete images. Whether it was stories often made up of how the EC oppressed us, took away our inherent British right to, uh, to eat prawn cocktail crisps uh, and unhealthy food or whether it was they took £350 million a week for us, which they said they could spend on the NHS. They took these abstract understandings and they made them concrete. They wove them into things that affected our day-to-day -day experience. And they were incredibly powerful in doing so. Understanding the power of building on a sense of loss and a sense of inequity. Understanding the power of linking that to a sense of identity, of lost national identity. Understanding how to give people a feeling of possibility and empowerment that they could overcome those who they saw as acting against them. Remarkably reactionary, but remarkably powerful. And the mark to me of the failure of the Remain campaign to understand that it's as if you remember on the night before the referendum, they brought together the remaining living British Prime Ministers, Tory and Labour, to say, look, they thought everybody recognises that Brexit is a terrible thing. What they showed was that the political class, those which the Brexiteers identified as the enemy, was united in being against Brexit. What the Remain campaigns thought was their ace in the pack actually reinforced the Brexiteers' narrative. And so the Brexiteers won, and we're now living through the consequences. Let me give you another example. If there is reason to be happy today, it is of course the fact that Boris Johnson is no longer in Parliament. But it's interesting going back to the beginning, or at least the prehistory of Boris Johnson's parliamentary career. When he put himself forward as Tory candidate in Henley, and when he went before the selection committee, at the core of his speech was a story. He told the story of how his then wife, 
had given birth, and just after giving birth she fell asleep, and he was a bit peckish and there was some food there for her, and he decided to eat it. He ate out of the toast. And when she woke up, she says, I'm hungry, where is there food? And he says, oh dear, he said, I ate it. He says, but I'll go off and I'll find you some toast. And he goes up to the nurse and says, can you give me some toast? And she said, well, there was some toast. He said, I ate it. We said, well, we can't give you any more. And he says, I'll pay for it. And he says, well, we can't. I'm sorry, we're doing other things. We can't give you toast. And he concludes, this is why we need to put private money into the NHS. Now, it's an absurd story, and I'm sure most of us sitting here are thinking, what a, well, can I use the terms, what a nasty bastard to eat his food, <laughs> the food of his wife, and then uh, blame the NHS for it. But for his audience, what he did is take an abstract thought, right, private money in the NHS, and weave it into a powerful narrative of how his British man is right to eat when he wants to was being taken away by this bureaucracy that it was oppressive and he was striking for freedom in terms of demanding the right to pay for food in the NHS. He moralized it, he weaponized it, he made it concrete through the use of narrative. He exemplified certain social relations and abstraction in a very concrete and let me take those various ideas and then just summarise them in terms of the academic literature. The argument is that when you look at involvement in collective action, it depends on a number of things. The first is a sense of inequity. And the more that can be made concrete, the more it can be woven into everyday experience, the more powerful it is. The second is a sense of identity. If you're talking about collective action, you need to collectivise things. It's not that I am being oppressed, but we are being oppressed. We're having our basic rights taken away. We're having our fundamental values traduced. And so the third point is morality. <coughs> collective action is most powerful when it's seen not just as something I could do, but a moral imperative not to take part in collective action would not to be who I am. We did um, recently research on the Queen's funeral, or on the Queen's death. And many people, if you remember, asked, why did people take part in that queue? Why did they wait 20 hours to see the Queen lying in state? But what we found was that people didn't take part in that queue despite the hardship. They did it because of the hardship, because it proved that they were loyal. If it was easy, it would be meaningless, the concept of an ordeal. They did it because it proved who they were. But conversely, not to stand in that queue would not to be who they were. So this wasn't just a choice. This was something essential to who we are. That sense of moral obligation is critical. And the fourth factor is efficacy. Efficacy. People take part because they think it will have a consequence. And so that then leads to a problem. On the one hand, if we want to identify the real causes of our problems, we've just been talking about the nature of um, uh, the problems in terms of uh, food, in terms of public health, and we've seen how they are linked to the fundamental nature of um, you know, contemporary capitalist society, of neoliberalism. The problem is that if you say, look, to take part, we've got to overcome that, will lead many people to say, look, it's awful, but there's nothing we can do. On the other hand, you might have immediate goals, but then think, okay, we can achieve them, but what's the point? Is it any good? And I think the concept of efficacy and, and linking the short term and the immediate to the longer term is critical. When I think of my political activity, over the last 50 years, I, I, I tend to summarise it as making things get worse slightly more slowly. That's about the best you can look forward to. But the one exception in my lifetime, which I was very heavily involved in, was the anti-apartheid movement. Apartheid was destroyed. You know, I'm not saying that I did it, 
I'm not saying that the anti-apartheid movement did it. It was clearly done by the liberation movement in South Africa. But the solidarity of the anti-apartheid movement internationally was very important. And what was brilliant about anti-apartheid is it linked the micro to the macro. If you remember, the boycott campaign was about not buying South African fruit in the supermarket. Right? It was an act that was meaningful for me not to buy that orange. It was an act that was even more meaningful if we got shops not to stock those oranges. But of course, the important thing was to link those to a campaign to get other forms of boycott. The international sporting boycott, which had a huge impact. The international trade boycott. So linking the micro to the macro so that people get a sense of efficacy at the micro level and link it to the macro. And in terms of uh, coming closer to home, I think one campaign in which we tried to do that, uh, vis-a-vis -vis health, is the COVID pledge campaign, which some of you might have come across. It's uh, a campaign to get businesses, shops, to sign up to a commitment to, number one, encourage and support their workers to stay at home if they are ill, and number two, to make sure their premises are uh, safer in terms of COVID, have decent ventilation, uh, for instance. Now, getting a local shop or a local organisation to do it is not going to change that much. But in the act of doing that, first of all, you commit organisations to that and you build to the larger question, I think it's one of the biggest questions of public health probably as important to the 21st century as clean water was to the 19th and 20th century, and still in many parts of the world, the 21st century, the movement for clean air. So I think those issues are really important. But I want to finish, if I've got a few more minutes, by in a sense subverting everything I've said so far. One of the problems for me of the academic literature on social movement participation is it treats it as a terribly cognitive, intellectual type of exercise that people sit down, they calculate this, they calculate that, they think about morality and then they make a decision as to whether to go to a, uh, an event or not. Actually, the one thing that best predicts whether people go to an event, whether it be a demonstration or a meeting, is how many people ask them it's about social networks. And people go along for all sorts of reasons. I remember reading this wonderful book called They Should Have Served That Cup of Coffee. It was about the <coughs> very social movements in the States of the 60s. And it said, look, most people went by chance. They went because a friend was going. They went because somebody they fancied was there. They went because in the evening there was going to be a band they wanted to see. When I was a student, we used to go to various things. We used to go to Grunwick. Does anybody remember Grunwick? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it was a really important industrial dispute that was about South Asian women being um, discriminated against. Well, you know, I went because I believed in it. But I also went because it was a free coach up to London. I could have a day out in London. And um, uh, often the beer was cheap at, the, at, at what was going on. And we, people go for all sorts of reasons. Okay. So actually getting people take part in collective action is often a matter of social networks and using those social networks. One of the most effective things we can do is not to, um, in a sense, proselytize, but to say to our friends, look, I'm going to this event. Do you fancy coming along with me? But there's another point. And I think this is much underestimated. And this is where I think that most of the organizations I've been in make mistakes. So I think we also need to think about what are the barriers to participation. The real question actually often isn't persuading people. I suspect a lot of people hearing the arguments today will be persuaded, but they don't take part in the movement. There's been really interesting research done in the US showing that when it comes to environmentalism, for instance, black people are far more concerned than white people, and for good reason. Because it is the oppressed who always loops out. Who is it who had to stay behind in flooded New Orleans? Black people. And who is it who fled to the hills? It was white people, and they're four by four. So black people have good reason to be more concerned about the environment because they're affected. 
but they are far less likely to see themselves as environmentalists. They are far less likely to identify with the movement because they think the identity of that movement is at odds with their own identity as black people. They see the environment, this movement, as middle class and privileged and white. And in many ways they are right. Some of the barriers to participation are simply the ways we do things. Where we meet, are they accessible? The times at which we meet, can you meet if you've got um, a young family? And we've heard one of the major factors which undermines participation is the fact that people are working so long they're absolutely knackered. So how can we find forms of participation that don't ask you after a 10 hour shift to then go to a meeting? People are also put off because they think they're going to be looked down upon. In the environmentalist movement, they think, well, yeah, I, I agree we ought to bring greenhouse gases down, but people are going to look down on me because, you know, I'm not a vegetarian. Or they look, they'll look down on me because I've got leather shoes or whatever it might be. And sometimes, I think as activists, we can be purists. We can demand that before you enter the door, you've got to have the right position on everything. Right? That was true of the, the you know, anti-apartheid movement. In the anti-apartheid movement, at our meetings, it was presupposed that this was a problem of capitalism. And that to be anti-apartheid, you couldn't be anti-apartheid if you were pro-capitalist. But the point about that is it stopped people starting the journey. You should allow people in if they're anti-apartheid. And then you'll discuss and see why that is and, and how apartheid comes about and what's sustaining apartheid and so on. You might at the end point then come to agree around an anti-capitalist position, but to make it a condition to enter in is to stop people taking that journey. So again, one's got to be really careful in a movement of not being maximalist in the conditions which are necessary for entry into that movement. We've got to be far more open. We've got to be far more, uh, if you like, uh, inclusive rather than judgmental of people who we think you know, have got the wrong position on certain things. And the final thing is this. Sometimes the things we're talking about are incredibly serious. Of course they're terribly serious. And they're heartbreaking. And they're deeply moving. But there is a danger that we end up being miserable and glum all the time. And you want people to come along in part because they agree, in part, of course, because they want to be involved in the movement, but because they're going to look forward to coming along. They're going to meet their mates. Interesting things are going to happen. It's going to be fun. You know that old song, um, rather gendered, girls just like to have fun. Well, I think we need to get people to understand that activists just want to have fun. Mm -hmm. And create an environment in which you don't think, oh, God, I'm doing the right thing, I'm going to a meeting, but rather, you know, it is going to be a good evening in various ways. We've got to involve people and think about the demographics of people we want to involve and think about the barriers. So yes, we've got to mobilise. And yes, we've got to understand the process of mobilisation. And yes, as many people have emphasised, we've got to tell a good story. But we've also got to understand the ways in which we need to be more inclusive. The ways in which we need to create an environment in which the campaigning we're doing is part of your life and affirms your life and doesn't take you away from the, your everyday life. And when that happens, I think we're much more likely to bring far more uh, people in and thereby be far more effective. So I'll stop. Thank you very much, Steve. So, you may have a little bit of time for questions. I'm aware that the starch combined with the heat is uh, starting to make some people get a bit sleepy. So, we won't spend too long before we do group, group work. But, uh, yeah, your question. Yeah, that was awesome. I enjoyed it. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, mainly because I haven't been to myself, so what I part of, part of what I heard you saying is basically about the enemy has the discipline and the means of having a single narration which may be smart and intuitive into sensing what, you know, what can be effective. And I was thinking that with the movement, one of the main things that is spontaneous, honest and true, 
and sometimes it derives from you know, desperation or oppression or things like that. And I was thinking that such a movement does not have the luxury of having an internal discipline, of having a single narration or the means of creating that, that narration. And I am a bit divided because I know that times are changing and that we cannot win, we cannot win the battle of narrations if we don't become that. But becoming that for me means losing what is true and meaningful about the movement, which is a bit spontaneous and honest and deriving from you know those things. Mm. I mean that's really the point. So how how do you get uh, unity without autocracy? And how do you get unity with um, uh, spontaneity? I mean, I don't think it's impossible. Um, and I, I, I certainly think that you're right that, uh, I mean, one of the things that autocratic leaders do is they define anybody who disagrees with them as not being of us. I mean, the whole point about democracy is democracy allows for debate but except you're all part of the same community. So if you disagree with me, it's not because you're an enemy, it's because you've got a different view of how to advance the group. And one of the ways of spotting an autocrat is somebody who says anybody who disagrees with them is not a person of goodwill debating uh, about how to advance us, but it's an enemy. I mean, if you remember back to 2016 and Trump, what was fascinating was the way that anybody who disagreed with him was not American. Okay. The judge was Spanish. Um, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton was to be locked up. She was to be removed from the community. She was a criminal. Okay. And so, to me, the difference between autocracy and democracy is how you deal with disagreement. Right? Democracy actually is about welcoming disagreement because it forces you to clarify your own views. Uh, for autocracy, disagreement is something to be stomped upon and to be destroyed. But if you recognise that, this is, you know, the sociologists out there, you know, this is the Habermasian notion of the public sphere, it can bring about uh, agreement um, precisely because it respects difference and precisely because it recognises we are all together, we are all people of goodwill, we are all um, uh, wanting to achieve the same thing. Things go wrong, and it is true of the British left at least, but we tend to have a schismatic tendency if people disagree with us, we tell them that they're the class enemy and we exclude them. I think there is uh, a left discourse which can embrace difference, uh, but embrace we are a, a community uh, together trying to achieve the same thing. Um, I also think it also depends upon accepting the fact that we might be in a minority without taking our toys away and playing elsewhere and we, and, and we have to come together at some point to be effective but we also have to be willing to you know, try out those narratives and if they fail to admit that we are wrong okay that that humility and that willingness to accept difference and disagreement as something that strengthens us rather than weakens us i think is is critical to a democratic and effective level. Yeah, there's a question up at the back. So, I mean, I think, again, I mean, these are you know, brilliant insights. 
I would agree with what proviso, which is that the notion that we are under stress is not necessarily a reality. It's often an invention to say to us, you cannot disagree. Okay, so it's the concept of enemyship. The concept of enemyship is uh, associated with my friend Carl Schmitt, who was a Nazi jurist and whose ideas have entered those of the far right. Steve Bannon, for instance, uses enemyship. And this is the notion that you know, there are enemies out there, they're trying to destroy us. So number one, in identifying that enemy, I show that I'm on your side and my rivals, anybody who disagrees with me, is colluding with that enemy by under uh, by the threat. And secondly, you all have to agree with me because we can't afford, afford to differ. Um, if you wanted to uh, you know, look historically in terms of the problems of the left, you could argue that you know, the notion of war communism, which uh, entered into the, uh, uh, you know, the lexicon of the, uh, of, 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 of the Soviet Communist Party uh, in, in, in the Civil War, banned factions, banned disagreement, began to say that difference was destructive, and that's been, I think, incredibly toxic ever since. So the notion of enemyship is really problematic. Now, just to add one further comment, if you look at attempts to use academic knowledge to frame how we organize as social movements, probably a number of you know Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals. Anybody remember that? It was very popular in the 60s. Now, interestingly, Alinsky said the left should do that. We should create enemies to mobilize people. Um, the problem with that is that the right have taken it over and done even better. So the Tea Party took on this notion, and it's the far right in the states now who use the, the Alinsky rather than the left. So uh, going back to the, the previous comment, I think I'm not sure we should borrow the enemy's clothes in that sense. I think we do need to be much more open and to recognize difference, because I think if we go down that enemyship path, um, it can be profoundly counterproductive. Right, Sue, so you have a comment there? I just wanted to hear your thoughts on how important the narrative is as opposed to the narrative. Mm. Um, I mean, would Brexit have been so successful without what appears to be Johnson's intuitive grasp of how to sell a message. Conversely, would the anti-apartheid movement have been so effective without Mandela, you know? So what, what's the balance between the narrative and the narrator? And how important is it to have sort of charismatic figures? Yeah. So, yes, I'm sure Boris Johnson would love to be, know that he's being mentioned in the same sentence as Nelson. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, some of the work I do is on leadership, um, where we look at this issue in great detail. What we say social influence and leadership is all about is not about forcing us to do particular things. If I put a gun to your head and say walk left, you'll walk, walk left. But that's not leadership. I take that gun away. You'll either stop walking left or walk right on purpose. Real leadership is to get you to want to do something, to influence you. And group leadership, collective leadership, is about defining who we are and what we value. Okay, so what is necessary for me to be in a position to say who we are and what we value? One of the key things I need to do is to say I am one of us. Okay, I speak for us. I understand our culture. And when you look at leaders, time and again, they create narratives of their own history and they perform in ways that exemplify the fact they're one of us. And again, I think Johnson is an interesting example in that regard. Because in his case, the other is the political class. Okay? The other is the establishment. You know? And therefore, all his infelicities, all his old language, all his breaking the rules are breaking their rules to say, I'm not like them. And there's this wonderful account by a journalist who says he, 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 he goes to, a, to an event and Johnson turns up and he's a bit late and he's flustered and his pears all over the place and his shirt's out and he's fiddling around with his notes and he thinks, oh, this is not really... And then he goes to a meeting a year later and Johnson does exactly the same because what he's doing is performing the fact that I'm not an ordinary politician. His breaking of their rules proves he's one of us. 
And Trump, similarly, was very, very skillful at doing that. I mean, transgression is part of their persona, but transgression of the other's rules. So the ways in which leaders, both in the way they tell stories of who they are and where they came from and their upbringing, a great example is John Major, who, if you remember, at one point told us he was the son of a failed circus performer, so he's an ordinary guy like everybody else and understand unemployment. It wasn't a lie. It was a selective account. His dad was a businessman. There are various businesses and they failed occasionally. And once, in a short period, he did work as a circus performer. But what they're, they're constructing narratives of themselves which merge with the narrative of the group so they can say, which I am in a position to say who we are. Uh, and that's a long way of saying you're absolutely right. It is important for a leader to construct a narrative of themselves as it is for them to construct narratives about ourselves and who we are and what's happening to us and how to deal with it. So I'm going to just um, wrap up there, I think, and just leave us to thank Steve. For <laughs>